And uh, now we're going to switch gears and hear, uh, it's our pleasure to hear from David Zvet uh, from Simon Fraser University, who's going to tell us about revving your molecular engines or engine. So we look forward to this next talk and thanks again. Um, and remember to stay around uh, afterwards and continue asking, uh, continue discussing with Cindy and David. Great. Uh, so thank you very much um, to the organizers uh, for putting on both for the invitation and for putting on a great series uh, and also to the audience for making this a really nice interactive uh, series. Um, I, I run our local biophysics seminar series and we copy a lot of the things that we've learned from what works well um, here. So thank you again for uh, providing this really great uh, resource for the community. So uh, here is a shot of the SFU campus. If you don't know, Simon Fraser University is right on the outskirts of Vancouver. Uh, we're on a little mountain. They call it a mountain right here. And yellow is the physics department. And we're right on the edge of civilization looking out on glorious wilderness uh, beyond. It's quite a lovely place um, to do science. Let me start off by acknowledging uh, funding sources that have made uh, this work possible. Um, and I will, I will jump right into it. So my, my group's research is really motivated uh, at its most fundamental level by the observation that there's this second law of thermodynamics and in some really basic way, it's inconvenient for living things. The second law says that the entropy of the universe increases over time. We've been at this for several billion years. So you would expect if you look out into the world to see very disordered states of the world, high entropy states, some sort of primordial soup, right? But we know that living things have, have, have counteracted that tendency in some way. Uh, when we look at the biosphere, it's in fact not disordered. It's actually very ordered, both structurally, dynamically. Living things have been able to sort of carve out meaningful order in the face of this ineluctable increase in entropy of the universe over time. And there's no huge mystery at this, at this level. Uh, we know that the earth is not an equilibrium system, constant energy input from the sun, and living things have essentially evolved to siphon off energy from that constant energy input to create order in the face of the general increase of entropy. Um, I'm not the first person to talk about things this way, uh, no less a, a name check physicist than Erwin Schrodinger, uh, late in life, uh, actually 75 years ago, had a really impactful monograph um, where he equated death with the decay into thermodynamical equilibrium. There's really something, something fundamental about being alive that requires it to be out of equilibrium. And, and myself and my group are really interested in thinking about how does how do living things actually do that in a, in a functional way, avoid this uh, second law in some sense. At the molecular level, the way that they essentially implement this program is through molecular machines. So protein complexes that convert between different forms of energy. And I'd like to suggest we really should think about them at some fundamental level as converting between different non-equilibrium stores of energy or of free energy. And that's really the fundamental functional role that they play. Some of my favorite examples of these include transport motors like kinesin and myosin that transport cargoes within cells along cytoskeletal filaments. My favorite uh, motor by a long shot is ATP synthase, an ingenious rotary motor uh, that creates uh, ATP, that synthesizes ATP. You can think of these transport motors as converting non-equilibrium concentrations of ADP, ATP, inorganic phosphate into non-equilibrium spatial distributions of their various cargoes. Um, ATP synthase, you can think of as converting non-equilibrium distributions of protons across a membrane into non-equilibrium concentrations of ATP and ADP. So I think that's really a basic aspect of what these machines do. We like studying them uh, for various reasons when they malfunction, uh, there are various human diseases that result. Uh, essentially any interesting biological process uh, involves them at some, at some basic level. When people are making novel synthetic molecular machines, uh, they often look for inspiration to what biology has evolved. Um, and finally, I just think it's super cool that biology has been able to evolve machines that really at some basic level look an awful lot like the kinds of machines that engineers create at the human scale, but as I'll argue, really have some very important uh, meaningful differences um, from them. 
So uh, we actually saw this video a few weeks ago in this series. We see this in lots of seminar series. It's a, it's a fanciful video made to show nominally kinesin walking along a microtubule dragging some vesicular cargo along. And at some level, I love this movie. It's very inspiring. It's movies like this and images like this that really got me interested in biophysics in the first place. Um, but it's important to realize that it really glosses over a lot of detail. And so most importantly, for, for my purposes, uh, these are nanoscale soft matter objects. So thermal fluctuations, the constant buffeting by the water molecules surrounding them and the other molecules that crowd them in the cell means that they're, they're constantly interconverting between different conformations. You should not think of these molecules as behaving in some deterministic fashion. A more faithful depiction by the same, video, the same studio a few years later uh, tries to capture more of this stochasticity that's really fundamental to the behavior of these machines. Um, on average, they do achieve some sort of functional outcome, but that average behavior is, is layered on top of uh, very large fluctuations in their behavior. And so I think that's really important to keep in mind when thinking quantitatively about, about how these machines actually uh, work. So um, I'd like to argue that molecular machines inhabit a relatively distinctive physical regime compared to what we're used to thinking about at the, at the more human scale. So first off, they're fundamentally far from equilibrium, like living things are in general. If this kinesin is at equilibrium, it's as likely to go backwards as forwards, not achieving any functional outcome. This ATP synthase is as likely to hydrolyze ATP as it is to synthesize it at equilibrium. So really, in order for them to be functional at all, they need to be driven by non-equilibrium driving forces and they need to then convert those into other non-equilibrium stores of free energy to really do what they need to do. As I've argued on the previous slide, they're subject to very large stochastic fluctuations, leading to all kinds of a zoo of different behaviors that, that are not present if they were just deterministically proceeding in some preferred direction. They pause, they take side steps, they take back steps. And so fundamentally, uh, the design of them perhaps uh, takes into account how to mitigate these fluctuations or perhaps even take advantage. Um, of these fluctuations. Due to the energy and velocity scales for uh, these machines, they're in what's known as the low Reynolds number regime. So there's no inertia in their behavior. You can't depend on inertia carrying you from one stage of your cycle to another. Everything is overdamped motion. Everything requires stochastic kicks in order to move on to the next uh, state. And finally, these machines have to operate rapidly. So for example, ATP synthase clicks over at something like 10,000 RPM. Uh, so you know, from an undergrad thermal perspective, we can't make appeals to a Carnot cycle to understand how it's behaving. Some quasi-static analysis that says, oh, we're going very slowly is not sufficient to really understand how they behave. So based on these observations, this kind of motivates the, the work that my group does, trying to understand what are sort of design or engineering principles for how you achieve out of equilibrium biomolecular energy and occasionally information transmission. So given that molecular machines operate with a large stochastic component very quickly without any inertia and generally far from equilibrium, what are the physical limits on what they can achieve? What kinds of designs actually achieve these limits, actually reach or saturate these limits? When we look out into the naturally evolved world, do molecular machines actually conform at all with the kind of uh, theorist uh, picture that, that we devise? Um, and what guidance does this give for making uh, new uh, novel machines? So I wanna say a bit more about ATP synthase that's gonna frame the question that I wanna, that I wanna talk about uh, today and the rest of the, of the talk. Um, so ATP synthase, so it, it is in, in eukaryotic cells, it's embedded in uh, the mitochondrial membrane. This blue part here is, is uh, embedded in the membrane, other machinery creates an imbalance of protons across that membrane. And then what ATP synthase does, and, and, and within the mitochondrial membrane in the, in the mitochondrial matrix, there's an imbalance of ATP and ADP. So what ATP synthase does is it brings protons across the membrane through this blue subunit known as, known as FO. That proton translocation is coupled to rotation of this uh, central rotational crankshaft. And rotation of that axle or that crankshaft then drives the red part F1 to make ATP against the natural chemical driving force. You've got an excess of ATP and yet F1 is making ATP out of ADP and PI. And so in the context of FO and F1, I think 
an interesting question we might ask, okay, and then ATP is, as many of us know, it's this portable, long-lived energy currency. You can even think of it like a battery. Essentially, this is a factory making batteries that can then be packaged and sent elsewhere to then drive otherwise unfavorable reactions by, by coupling the hydrolysis of ATP to them. So in the context of ATP synthesis, uh, synthase, uh, if I wanna improve the rate at which it clicks along, I wanna increase how fast it can make ATP, generally sounds like a good thing. What can I say about the connections between FO and F1 that would promote uh, rapid uh, synthesis of ATP? And more generally, I'm a statistical physicist, so I like to abstract from a particular question and ask more general questions. In order to maximize machine output, what can I say about the strength of coupling between machine components that actually will achieve that? And so that's the question I wanna, I wanna talk about today. So the specific uh, project uh, was led by Emma Latowers, who, was a, who is a PhD student in, in my group and uh, was uh, assisted quite ably by Joseph Lucero, who's a master's student um, and is, is applying to PhD programs uh, uh, as we speak. Um, so um, you can think about the model that we're gonna use to explore this as kind of going one step beyond the simplest machine models that you can imagine. So the simplest models that, that you know, many papers are written about uh, take the perspective of the machine as sort of a single atomic unit that is subject to inflows and outflows of energy. So you can think of the, the, the chemical driving forces due to this imbalance of protons as doing chemical work on this machine. Uh, there's some output of chemical work. And in the, in the meantime, it's also dissipating some heat to its surroundings. And so what we wanna do is we wanna resolve a little bit more the internal details of this machine, but we're theoretical physicists, so we're not gonna go crazy. What if we had two components to this machine? So the FO part, that, that is driven by the proton imbalance and the F1 part that is trying to drive ATP synthesis against its natural uh, reaction direction. Okay, so here you've got chemical work being done on one part of the machine. It's got to somehow transduce that activation into uh, activating the downstream component and that downstream component then can output useful uh, work out the other end. And of course, they're both in contact with their thermal surroundings. So the cartoon model that, that we're gonna to use to explore this issue of how the strength of the coupling between these components affects the, the rate at which this engine clicks along, the output power uh, is, is, is the following. So if you look at F1's behavior on its own, you can isolate F1, put it on a cover slip, attach some micron sized object to it so you can actually visualize the rotary motion of this crankshaft. You can see that it inhabits, it likes to be in one of three particular uh, rotational states. So we can envision sort of the landscape of F1 as being some limited number of metastable states separated by barriers. It's got periodic boundary conditions because it's got rotational motion. And so um, I've got this particle representing F1 diffusing on this rotational corrugated landscape. FO has a similar landscape representing its own metastable states corresponding to translocation of these protons. And they're elastically coupled in some way that provides the, the route for which energy can be transduced between the two. And then I've drawn here schematically a couple weights representing the driving forces of the proton imbalance trying to push FO in one direction and the ATP imbalance trying to push or pull uh, F1 in the opposite direction. And it's sort of the struggle between these two that, that leads to the, the actual kind of machine characteristics that we wanna explore. Uh, and importantly, with this kind of model, slip becomes possible, right? In principle, FO can be driven so strongly that it rotates through its cycle without F1 actually being pulled along if the driving is too strong or the coupling is too weak. You can unfold this picture into sort of an energetic landscape that you may have seen before in sort of schematic pictures of machine behavior. Here I've got FO on some corrugated landscape that's tilted due to the driving force of this proton imbalance that's trying to push it in one rotational direction. Likewise, F1 is on this corrugated landscape, but tilted the other way because the driving force is trying to push it in the opposite direction. And we've got some elastic coupling between the two um, that is, that is going to achieve this transduction or not, depending on how strong the coupling is. Our potential is relatively simple. We have a sinusoidal term for the potential that FO experiences on its own, sinusoidal for F1 on its own, and then some the simplest possible coupling energy you can imagine on a, on a periodic landscape like this. 
And so what we'll do when we're exploring this model and its implications is we'll imagine for simplicity, similar barrier heights to these two diffusing machine components. Uh, for now, we'll set the alignment or the phase offset between the two potentials to be zero, though we'll relax that assumption later. And we'll set an equal number of barriers uh, to be three. Uh, we've explored this more broadly, but I don't think I'll have time to go into what, uh, what that looks like. And then the basic exercise we'll do is we'll vary the coupling strength in this model between the two components, and we'll see how that affects the actual throughput of this machine. So let's go to the, the super simplest case to build our intuition before we go to the full-blown results. What if I have no barriers? So I just have two components diffusing on flat landscapes that are tilted due to the driving forces of their respective chemical baths. So in that case, I'll have a picture like this up here. <clears throat> Plotted here is the efficiency as a function of the coupling strength from weakly coupled to strongly coupled. Uh, and the efficiency plotted as a ratio of the maximal possible efficiency. What you see is that when the coupling is weak, the systems don't feel each other. They just blow right by each other and they each uh, dissipate energy as going downhill. As you make the coupling strength stronger and stronger, you cross over into something where you actually achieve transduction and you actually achieve a, a maximal efficiency. On the top here, I'm plotting now this output power as a function of the coupling strength. And you see a similar trend as you increase the coupling strength, you eventually achieve productive transduction of energy, and you eventually reach some maximal um, output power at maximal coupling. The stronger your coupling, the less slip there is, the more output you get. When you now make this slightly more complicated, you add these energetic barriers, you now require the system to receive stochastic kicks in order to actually make progress. The picture changes a bit. The efficiency still is a monotonic function of the coupling strength. However, your um, output power is now no longer monotonic in the coupling strength. So in particular, we can calculate exactly the infinite coupling result when the two systems move in lockstep. And what we see here is that the output power is actually maximized at an intermediate coupling strength. Okay, so if you make the coupling too large, the system actually moves slower diffusively. And we're going to try to understand why that is. The actual uh, uh, power increase due to this intermediate coupling is in this particular case, double what it would be at infinitely strong coupling. We were quite surprised when we saw this result and did a lot of kicking the tires to make sure it was real and then to understand uh, why this is. You can make the barriers higher between the metastable states and the result is to make overall the output slower, right? You've got larger barriers to diffuse over, but the actual accentuation at optimal coupling is actually even stronger now a 13 times increase in the output power if you pick the right coupling rather than infinite coupling. You can understand this with a simple theory. Uh, we're now gonna show some schematic diagrams of the behavior of FO and F1 as they diffuse. We've gotten rid of the tilts just to make the picture simple, but the math, um, the math follows uh, without any trouble uh, with the tilts. So what's gonna happen when I have FO and F1 sitting at, at the same angular state? The dominant next step is for FO to push ahead. It's got the stronger driving of force. So it's eventually gonna diffuse over its barrier and reach the, the, the first state on. At this point, you've got a branch. Either F1 can diffuse over the same barrier and catch up, in which case you've got essentially some inchworming behavior. This is what you want the machine to do. You want FO to be driving ahead and pulling F1 along up its gradient. Alternatively, you can have FO diffuse another step along its reaction cycle. At this point, with three metastable states, FO is now actually both two steps ahead, but because of the periodic boundary conditions, it's only one step behind. So the next dominant step will be FO to catch up with F1, and now FO has lapped F1. It has made an entire cycle consuming protons down this gradient without achieving any functional output in terms of synthesizing ATP. So, the, ratio, the, the rates of these critical steps are what can, are going to determine whether you have transduction or slippage. So you can take the ratio of these rates, just a simple Arrhenius picture of exponential dependence of the rate on the energy difference between the barrier and the metastable state. And what you find is a relatively simple result. The main things I want you to take away from this equation are that one, there's no dependence on the barrier height um, because essentially it affects each of these competing rates similarly. 
And as you make the driving forces stronger, you promote more slip. As you make the coupling strength stronger, you reduce the slip because the systems are more tightly coupled together and are gonna translocate together. One inchworming only achieves a third of a angular cycle of transduction, whereas a slip is a full cycle. So you have to take that into account. You need some other weak assumptions in order to make sure these are the dominant steps. And what the picture you get out is a prediction for where this efficiency drops off from maximal to negligible, essentially. That's the prediction in the black dashed line here. This matches very well with both the numerics for significant barrier heights, as well as the theory for no barrier heights. And we can do this across a variety of parameter space, different driving forces, different ratios of the driving forces between the two chemical baths. And we see that this gives us a good prediction of the efficiency drop off. So the picture that uh, results is that we've got a competition between reducing slippage by increasing the coupling, but also it slows the forward steps when you have stronger coupling because the two systems then have to diffuse together over a given barrier. Put these together and you get a picture for what this optimal coupling strength should be as a function of the different driving forces. And again, this picture is borne out across parameter space. The optimum closely matches what we see just by the full numerics of the full system. Um, so that's what I wanna say about that picture. The second thing you can ask is, what about the angular alignment of these different potentials? How does that affect the output power? And, and so we vary that. The basic picture that emerges, I've plotted here the output power as a function of the angular phasing between the two potentials. When the systems are weakly coupled, they don't feel each other. And it doesn't matter what their alignment is, they just dissipate energy each in turn without being coupled. As you crank up the coupling, you progressively see both an increase in the output power and the efficiency, as well as now a dependence on what this alignment is between the two subsystems. And so as you push to very strongly coupled in the, in the rigidly coupled limit, we can, uh, sorry, in the rigidly coupled limit, we can actually exactly calculate how the power depends on phasing. You get a result that says that you wanna be out of alignment, the two subsystems, because that's essentially gonna flatten your landscape, your overall landscape that the two subsystems together experience. And in that limit, you get about a 4X increase in the output power compared to if you had not optimal alignment. And you recover actually the result of the barrierless dynamics. Okay, so some intuition about these results. Intermediate strength coupling between components maximizes the output power. You have to be stiff enough that you don't have significant slippage because then you're just dissipating energy without accomplishing anything, but you need to be flexible enough to allow fluctuations to kick you over the barriers that you encounter. One way to think of this is that basically you wanna temporarily separate the barrier crossings that your multi-component machine has to accomplish. You wanna break a single large barrier into multiple barriers that your components can cross at different times. And because of the exponential dependence of fluctuations, their intensity on that energy, two small fluctuations are much more common than one large fluctuation. So it means you're gonna get many more stochastic kicks are gonna get you over the relevant barriers. And in this question of alignment, it, it can be really cast in a similar way. We want out of phase alignment to maximize our power. And really you can intuitively think about this as spatially separating the barrier crossings that your system needs to accomplish. Again, breaking down what would otherwise be a single large barrier into multiple smaller barriers that allow thermal fluctuations to, to, to have maximal impact and to push you over these barriers, essentially lubricating the process that you are trying to accomplish. So let me acknowledge the group uh, here. The work I highlighted today was done by Emma and Joseph, but we have a, a cast of characters that uh, keeps things lots of fun. We're always looking for people interested in undergrad term time or summer projects, grad school, uh, postdocs. So if any of this uh, strikes your fancy, please be in touch. And finally, let me just conclude by saying that what I've, what I've tried to show you today is that output power in these admittedly cartoonishly simple models of molecular machines is maximized at intermediate strength coupling, that you can rationalize this in terms of a simple uh, kinetic model, and that there really is a parallel story for the alignment of the potentials that suggests that you know, there, there, are there are several dimensions in which this basic strategy of breaking up large uh, stochastic fluctuations into smaller ones can really be productive in terms of achieving uh, maximal output.
Um, and I'll just mention one area we're looking into further at the moment is, is more of an information theoretic exploration. Uh, you can quite rigorously quantify the amount that the different components learn about each other in their dynamics. And this is, it, there's an emerging picture that this sort of information thermodynamics is very tightly coupled to more conventional thermodynamics. And so you can really tell uh, a learning story about what's happening here too uh, that has some interesting parallels. But I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you for your attention and, and welcome any, any questions. Thank you, David, for a great talk. I think Kim might be taking off for her class, so I will take over moderating duties from her. Uh, so I guess we have a number of questions, and I would start by asking this question from uh, Phil Nelson. And this question is uh, related to, you know, when you're talking about the simple kinetic model. So he asks, is this related to stochastic resonance? Uh, maybe. Uh, what I can say is that um, we have begun to think about that. Um, we've also looked, I didn't show any data for this, at where you change the, the number of the, the barriers and equivalently the number of metastable states. And that has some additionally complex, not totally obvious behavior that is suggestive of that kind of thing, but we really haven't done our homework yet to say anything definitive about that. But that's definitely an area that we are curious to kind of link up with. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would add to that, the fact that you're getting this output power to be maximum at an intermediate strength coupling probably is an additional, you know, sort of hint that it could be something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, agreed. And then the next question is from Eric Dufresne, and he asks, is there any experimental data on the coupling strength, maybe in the form of the number of ATPs produced per rotation? Yeah, so, um, so there's a fair bit of data on sort of the actual behavior of the machine as a whole without resolving any of the you know, internal detail. So what's known is that it's a relatively efficient machine. You know, the initial studies of it of like F1 by itself suggested something near unit efficiency. You put the two together and then you can quantify the output in terms of, you know, you've got various fluorescence reactions or luminescence that can tell you about the ATP produced. Mm -hmm. And you get things that look like something like two thirds to one efficiency in terms of transduction. Very little that I know of is known about the actual compliance of the different pieces. Mm -hmm. There have been some like molecular dynamic studies, which I'm quite skeptical of, even as a theorist, um, but that suggest, you know, uh, elasticities of, for example, the rotational crankshaft, so angular elasticity of that. If you look at the, if you look at the, the output maximizing coupling strength that we find in these simple models, you plug in, you know, reasonable parameters for FO, F1, you get uh, an elasticity, which is something like a factor of 10 weaker, more floppy than the measurements for simply the crankshaft itself. Mm -hmm. If you think about what we've done here, we've kind of folded all of the coupling into this one term. So you would expect whatever coupling we find is good here should be weak compared to the coupling of any piece in this chain of coupling that actually couples the proton translocation to the ATP synthesis. So we think we're we're in the ballpark of kind of the very rough estimates that people have, but these are different, these are difficult to uh, uh, quantify on their own. So I, I we're, we're very interested in following that up. In some sense, the motivation of this is more to take inspiration from machines like FOF1 ATP synthase and then explore just like on a very coarse level, like what direction do these various dependent variables change with as we vary these parameters and we already found surprising results there. We feel like it's sort of a next order question of like, okay, now wait a second, you know, mm -hmm. how do the quantitative uh, findings that we have measure up against the, the evolved systems? Mm -hmm. All right, and we will take one more question for you, David, and then we will go to the 15 minute discussion for this uh, seminar. So the next question is from Navish Vadva and he asks, can one separate the coupling and slippage to different parts of the axle? If yes, what implications does that have on the design of the ATP synthetase? Uh, let's see here. So I guess my, my, my feeling is there's something happening at the membrane with protons being translocated. There's something happening at the active site of F1 where it's making ATP. And there's a bunch of different mechanical components, some of which we can sort of understand like this rotational crankshaft and some of which are much more subtle, like the sort of detailed motions 
coupling the active site to the crankshaft, the crankshaft to the you know, translocation channel for the protons. So I would think of there being a lot of different components. And at each of these, some of them are in series, some of them are sort of in parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, you have an opportunity for slippage. And if it doesn't slip, then you are coupling. So I guess to me, I don't know what it would mean exactly for the, the two things to be conceptually or physically separated, but I'd be curious to hear more about what you mean by that question, I guess. I guess we can get to that maybe in the next part of the, you know, in the discussion. So thank you, Cindy and David, once again, for two really excellent talks. And thanks to Manusa for tweeting them. Uh, so now I guess we are going to enter the 15 minute discussion where, you know, we will take, I will read out some of the questions for Cindy and David from the chat. And you guys can also unmute yourselves and add to your questions, you know, if, if you know, if